Liebe Zuschauer, die legendäre amerikanische Gruppe The Weavers steht im Mittelpunkt des nun folgenden Films. The Weavers, das war nach dem Zweiten Weltkrieg die Wiederbelebung nationaler und regionaler Musiktraditionen. Der Film begleitet die Gruppe über mehrere Monate, blendet zurück in die Vergangenheit und zeigt ihr letztes gemeinsames öffentliches Auftreten. Daraus wurde kein sentimentaler Nachruf oder ein Denkmal, eher schon eine Liebeserklärung. Über 20 Titel werden gesungen, darunter so berühmte wie Guantanamera, If I Had a Hammer, Kisses Sweeter Than Wine oder Good Night Irene. One second, I'll tell you the truth. This is a wide angle lens, and I really shouldn't be using a wide angle lens. Oh, you're going out looking like fish eyes. What? Yeah, fish yeah. eyes. Get those fish. Get them. Look at me, right? No, 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 no. Come on. Yeah, Ronnie, Ronnie, Ronnie. Oh, oh, sorry. I thought I was in a play. No. Right, right. Oh, that's terrific. Terrific. Just, one more. We're just about done. Okay. Back to the dentist. No, no, no. <laughs> On top of old Smokey, all covered with snow, I lost my true lover for Gordon to snow. I travel around the country, almost every state of the Union, somebody will come backstage and say, will you autograph this old record of mine? There's an old Weaver's record, 20, 30 years old. And uh, I find out something that, that the family has treasured. <laughs> They've played it for their kids, for their grandchildren. You'll all be forsaken and never grow up. If I were to choose the main contribution of the Weavers, it's they were able to enter into the mainstream of American popular music, authentic folk songs. This had never been done on the scale that the Weavers themselves practiced and reached. They sold millions of records in jukeboxes, for one thing, on radio for another, until they were blacklisted. In short, anything that deals with the daily lives of people makes a folk song, and the Weavers sang it to millions. This is the re reunion shot here. Kind of neat. In 63. How did that affect you, Dan? That concert, what? Uh, well, that's when I, I decided I'd like to be a musician after that. Really? Yeah, because I felt that, uh, But I really could make that kind of music, so... Peter Paul and Mary uh, were very much the Weavers' children. The things that I remember most were the humor on stage, uh, Lee's uh, stories, especially, uh, or punctuating lines, timing, those kinds of things, I think are things that have become a part of me. To me, they are a unifying factor between the rebellious America of the 30s and the rebellious America of the 60s and 70s. I'm Lee Hayes, more or less. It was my good fortune, still is, to be a member of the Weavers. Wake up, wake up. I don't think we looked at the headlines much while we were making them. They just came with the territory. But some of the headlines couldn't be missed. They kicked us right in the teeth. People who were blacklisted get all sorts of honorable mention today. If it wasn't for the honor, I'd just as soon not have been blacklisted. I enjoyed the Weavers, and I still do. And I'm still trying to get them to do things the right way, my way. Lee, I've worked with for over 40 years. Uh, we were both interested in labor songs, 
started singing in a group called the Almanac Singers, which was later joined by Woody Guthrie and a lot of others. And it was primarily Lee who said, let's see if we can't get a group together which will rehearse a little more carefully than the Almanacs did. So it was that around 48, 49, the Weavers got together. The last five years or more, he's been battling diabetes. When they cut off his little toe, he wrote a poem, an ode to my little toe. So long, it's nice, been nice to know you. They amputated his foot, he said, us diabetics get shorter and shorter. Now he's in a wheelchair with both legs off, but though his body is truncated, his mind is more nimble than ever. I spent a good many years of my youth trying to liberate the sharecroppers. Now I got some of my own. <laughs> Here's the proof of it. Only one of them just gave me a hot pepper, damn it. Yeah. What should I do with them? You take a bite out of every one. <laughs> with all this, he's on wonderful terms with his neighbors, especially the kids who listen to his stories and help out. I used to quote Whitman, who wrote a poem on compost. From this noxious stink, such sweetness arises. But Jim here can answer Whitman in one word. she ut <laughs> <laughs> I'm making plans to be, uh, stuck into the pile myself someday. <laughs> a couple of years ago, Pete was making a record with Freddie producing it. Ronnie came in to sing with them on a song. It sounded marvelous. <laughs> said they missed the bass. If they'd asked me, I could have mailed the bass part in for that song. The Weavers hadn't been together. I think the last time we sang together was about 10 or 12 years ago at a birthday party somewhere. But listening to the record made me begin to feel it might be some fun for the four of us to get together sometime. these days. Can't travel much, so the only way we could get together would be right here. So I started writing memos to Pete and Ronnie and Fred. It's time to get together. Getting the Weavers together was about as easy as organizing a convention of cats. Pete Seeger has more damn projects than any one genius is entitled to. Okay, it's gonna drop building boats, helping to clean up the Hudson River. Cleaning up a river is a cause worth fighting for. And there's now literally thousands of people up and down this river that are involved uh, with the Clearwater and other similar organizations. Uh, many of them are just fighting for their hometown. It all comes under the heading of people working together not for profit. Plus giving concerts all around the world. Ronnie Gilbert divides her time between Vancouver and New York, where she's busy in the theater. Like a swan in the evening. Moves over the lake, yes. <clears throat> they tamper with folk music. <laughs> Ron, can we try to find the, the yeah. joining yeah. moment? Okay. As a swan in the evening moves over the lake. As a 
one in the evening moves over the lake. Fred Hellerman is writing, producing, recording, and raising kids. This is my son, my newborn son. He's bound for a brand new day. Perhaps I can walk along with him a little part of the way. Tomorrow lies in the cradle. Tomorrow has eyes that shine. Tomorrow lies in the cradle with a smile, a little. Finally, we found a day when everybody was free to come to a picnic. We just lost our sunshine. Howdy. Yeah. Hi. Which one How are you? How are you, Frank? Okay. Hi. I can get to you first. Hi there, little daddy. And that day was so full of euphoria that I had to take a laxity that night. I'm doing good. I think we were just wallowing in love and nostalgia all day long, plus all the neighbors and all the kids and dogs that turned up. But for a lady, you need a facelift. So I think that all in all, it was a kind of a, a good old Baptist love feast. Whenever the weavers get together to rehearse, the first thing we do is eat, and the second thing, and the third thing. Ah! <laughs> it's so good to see you. <laughs> My baby! My yeah, discovery. I am your baby. <laughs> I was your baby. <laughs> I really didn't know how the others would react to getting together after so many years. I figured we'd pick some of the old war horses that wouldn't take too much rehearsal. And at the picnic, we'd do some of our rehearsing right here in front of all the neighbors. We are traveling in the footsteps of those who've gone before. And we'll all be reunited on a new Oh, when the saints go marching in, go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in, go marching in. Oh, Lord, I want to be in their number. When the saints go marching in, go marching in. And when the trumpet sounds a call. Oh, miss the verse, miss the verse. I miss when the sun. How about that? I forgot my verse. I sing the when the sun. Are you singing when the sun? sun? Well, we can't get everything right these days, and what's more, we never did. Right. We are traveling in the footsteps of those who've gone before, and we'll all be reunited on a new and sunlit shore. Oh, when the saints go marching in, go marching in. Oh, when the saints go marching in, oh, Lord, I want to be in that number. When the saints go marching in, when the sun begins to shine, and when the sun... The first song we sang together sounded so good, so right, as if we'd only parted the day before. Of course, the ham and the pie helped, but the music got us really going the way it always has.
started with my thinking that there are some songs that you can't sing by yourself. You need a group to do them right. How can you sing Saints Go Marching in one person? It's darn hard. You have to have one voice answering another. And yet it grew to be much more than this. We began singing for, for anybody who would listen, in point of fact, for unions and left-wing groups. We sang union songs. We sang uh, songs of hope in that strange time at the end of World War II when already the world was preparing for Cold War. We still had the feeling that if we could sing loud enough and strong enough and hopefully enough, it would make a difference. And people would come drop in and hopefully they would drop a, <laughs> some money into a hat. And that's, for a while there, that's what we were all living on. I think we used to end up with about 10 bucks a piece. People were broke. They didn't have money to pay for anything. And we were getting ready to break up. We decided, well, wait a second. Let's see if we could maybe get a job somewhere at some nightclub or something so that we can make enough money so that we could live and stay together so that we can continue to sing down in Pete's basement on Wednesday afternoons. And what happened was that Pete had sung down at the Vanguard. So we went down there and we sang one night and uh, he said, okay, uh, why don't you come in for two weeks? And the two weeks is extended for another month. Well, we ended up staying there for six months. And during that time, oh, I guess a certain word got around like, it was the thing to see in New York, and that's where we first met Gordon Jenkins. When the Weavers first recorded for Decca, it was at Gordon's insistence. Gordon Jenkins uh, gave our songs a, the framework of a great big orchestra. And chorus. And chorus, that's right. Uh, he started off the record of Good Night, Irene, with a solo violin. Dee -dee, dee -dee, and then in came the chorus and the singers. Slickness took a certain rough edge off us, which at that particular time, I think, made us more acceptable to a mass audience. Good Night, Irene became what we call in the business an instant hit. It sold well over a million single copies, which was big for its day, played in all the jukeboxes throughout the country and constantly on radio, soon to be followed up by other hits. And here you had this obscure group situated mainly in New York City having this instant hit and getting instant national popularity, which was a little uncomfortable for the Weavers. All of a sudden, the Weavers were thrown into a completely different world. And it was very startling and very strange because one would begin working vaudeville houses or working in nightclubs. Or television. Would you look at that? Barbie doll and three stuffed dummies. I swear on Pete's chin whiskers, if we'd known how witless we looked, we would have given up music on the spot and turned to something socially useful like chicken plucking. <laughs> It was kind of a fluke that we, we reached a large number of people at all. Uh, really, I don't think any of us ever expected uh, to be selling a couple million records. Uh, but once we did, we found all sorts of possibilities there, and it was very exhilarating to reach a large number of people. They really felt that they could only sing the songs that they related to in their lives. So if they were trying to fight for civil rights or for equality or for peace or for whatever thing they were into, they really did and do and have lived their 
their lives uh, in a way which reflects these beliefs. So the music really stemmed from their their beliefs as people. It wasn't just a cosmetic job um, put up to uh, induce people to come and hear them sing. They really believed the things they sang about. Union miners stand together Heed no operator's tale Keep your hand Conclusion, bear in memory. Keep this password in your mind. God provides for every worker. When in union they combine, then by honest weights we'll labor. Union mind. Keep your hand upon the dollar and your eye upon the scale. Union miners stand together, need no operator's tale. Keep your hand upon the dollar. We will now pass out among you. It sure is. Pete says, we sound pretty good. He says, uh, maybe with a little more work, we might sound a little better. And all of a sudden, Pete's talking about appearing with him at Carnegie Hall, for heaven's sake. Oh, will we cut this? I'd cut into the cake first, I think, Billy. There we go, the bread. Here's the barley. Harold gets 10% of it, Jim. Uh, 20%. <laughs> well, I hadn't been to New York in 10 years, and I was sitting here in teetotal retirement. And the whole idea just seemed almost impossible. But when Pete gets an idea, you better either take to the hills or stick around and be prepared for action. Is that Weaver cake, Lee? Tastes like it. Pete's very enthusiastic. He says, there are two things that are going to impress this audience. Ronnie's voice is better than ever, and Lee can still sing in tune, <laughs> if not with any power. <laughs> But I'm dying to appear on that stage and see what that old audience looks like. See if they've still survived any of them. <laughs> when it was suggested that we, that the Weavers have, do a concert at Carnegie Hall again after so many years, I must admit that I had uh, very mixed feelings about this. Four decrepit folk singers come staggering <laughs> on stage. Wouldn't it be best just to leave it alone? and just let it be. When we first thought of a Carnegie Hall concert, I wasn't sure if really whether we could carry it off. Can you imagine a, bas a basketball team 30 years later trying to run through their old plays? But the idea, I must admit, of the, the feeling, the memory of how wonderful it was to sing with those guys was uh, one out in the end. Some kind of one more moment, one more possibility. And, and it was just um, what wonderful to think about doing that. Also, I wanted a chance to see Lee working again. I knew he had it in him. <laughs> He's just lazy, that's his problem. singing for a lot of years, haven't had any reason to. So if we're going to have a get-together, that's going to take a little bit of work. I listen to the records and try to sing with them, try to remember the words to the song and figuring out what keys they were in. Soft rhyming. 
Stop gambling. Stop staying out late at night. Go home to your wife and family. Stay there by your fireside. But to myself, I'm not sure just what is going to come out when the time comes. Bronco, se va paseo, we bronco, se va paseo. When we started to rehearse, we had to work for a couple of weeks every day. Con mistero, con vecino, con garam y con modesto, con el comandante Carlos, no hay mil ni piano con miedo. Venga, jaleo, jaleo, sueño de una metralladora y Franco se va a paseo, y Franco se va a paseo. It's ironic that Venga Leo, which is one of the greatest songs we ever did, is a war song. Although it is a song of a war on the right side in the Spanish war against fascism. <laughs> we can work now, because this is the reason I came. <laughs> I wanted to hear this once more while I was alive. Now I'm ready to quit. You all go home. Well, you can't, I'll tell you, I got another song. I'll for... go back in there and pass out. But before you do that, um, uh, before you decide to do that sometime today, I want to play another song for you that may make you decide to live another 90 years. Oh. <laughs> but who's counting? Yeah. Listen, would you sing this to me? I've never heard it. All I know about Woody's relativity song is that there's nothing he didn't write about, including relativity, and he got a big kick out of this one. I just heard it I just on paper. Can't go east or west. I can't go north or south. I can't go up or down. But I can still go round and round. I can still go round and round. I can still go round and round. Out of here. Uh, if we look in the Woody literature, I swear to God, he had I can still go in and out, which was the yes. thing that tickled him most. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You left that out? I don't ever remember. <laughs> <laughs> that was the whole part of the song. It, <laughs> the Woody's relativity song. You can't go it's, North it's really South, a song about how to make relatives. But I can <laughs> still go <laughs> in and out. He, uh, he thought that was great. But I would love to take a crack at Wasn't That a Time. Yeah, I mean, that was a song time, that used yeah. to give me the shivers. Okay. So. <laughs> I just wish we could update it a little bit. Remember B flat. Our fathers bled at Valley Forge. The snow was red with blood, their faith was warm. At Valley Forge, their faith was brotherhood. Wasn't that a time? Wasn't that a time? A time to try. The soul of man, wasn't that a terrible time? Brave men who died at Gettysburg. Now lie in soldiers' graves, but there they stem the slavery tied and there the faith will save wasn't that a time wasn't that a time a time to try the soul of man wasn't that a terrible time i think it's interesting to note that the initial work of the weavers took place while truman and eisenhower were in office and when some very sad things were happening in this land and in the world the progressive movement came to a critical crossroads if it wasn't actually stopped by the Wallace defeat in 48. The Peekskill riots appeared to many to be a signal for a kind of a general assault on civil liberties 
rather than the victory that we all claimed, the tragedy of the Rosenberg executions really shook the faith of humanity all over the world. We didn't have any more May Day parades for celebrating militant unionism, and actually there wasn't any militant unionism to uh, appeal to working people. Korea was going on, hardly anybody noticing except the families who got their sons' bodies back for burial. So during that time, while our following didn't reach huge proportions, and while we were political only in the most general sense, a lot of people in our audience thought of us as political performers. Our faith cries out, we have no fear. We dare to reach our hand to other neighbors far and near to friends. In every land, isn't this a time? It's a time, a time to pray. Isn't this a wonderful time? Oh, no. Isn't this a wonderful time? You got the last line right. Yeah. Songs are dangerous. The Weavers sang about unions, civil rights, the friendship of all nations at a time when McCarthy and the House Committee on Un-American Activities tried to censor our beliefs. So in 1952, the blacklist fell on us. Those were scoundrel times, built on fear and the lies of informers very well paid by the FBI. But, uh, Here we go. Weaver. Deny Weaver's quit TV over red issue. Now, who denied? We didn't deny it. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we didn't quit. They kicked us off. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you know what you don't have in here of uh, uh, that Ohio thing is the thing I remember well, uh, stepping off the plane and uh, met by a lot of reporters and stuff and waving newspapers in front of us saying, Will Weavers sing at Ohio State Fair? Yes, says so and so. No, says so and so. And it was moral. I mean, you think war had been declared or something. You know what? The uh, Columbus Citizen editorial goes on, though. It ends. Saying this seems unfair and unjust to allow this slur to stand will be to reflect on the integrity and good name of this Ohio State Fair. If there's more substantial evidence against the Weavers, it should be brought forward. Otherwise, their contract should be honored. Mm -hmm. well, 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 well. The crisis of the blacklisting was much more severe than a lot of people even imagined. Number one, Decca Records, in effect, dropped the Weavers. Radio stations would not play Weavers records television would not interview the weavers clubs were a problem uh, there were a number of, of engagements uh, in which uh, the weavers went out there and found that uh, there was almost vigilante groups attempting yeah. it. I, think. I remember in a place called daffy's bar and grill in cleveland i don't know if ronnie mm -hmm. remembers this remember well. a bunch of rather drunken people came in there and interrupted uh ronnie when she was about to sing the song to say why don't you sing the Star Spangled Banner? And Ronnie sweetly said, well, let's do it sometime, we're not drunk. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know, maybe in the long run, maybe we made better music for being blacklisted. Who knows? It would have been nice if there had been no blacklist. I say it would have been nicer for America if there had been no blacklist. I'd be even nicer for America if there was no blacklist now. Of all the good things, because the media has the greatest chance in the world to do things, good things. And uh, it's in a commercial straitjacket. In other places, it may be in a political straitjacket, but here's a commercial and political straitjacket, too. The blacklist forced us to take a sabbatical, and a mundical, and a tusical. But after three years of not working, we got bored with the blacklist and mad. The only answer to that kind of crap was to get together again. At first, nobody would rent us a theater, but somehow Harold got us the best concert hall in the country. I was able to get uh, Carnegie Hall, I think it was in December of 55. Well, that again was a historic concert, of course, sold out very, very quickly, had a tremendous press reportage. We were fortunate enough to record that concert. I took the chance and got the private recording set up. No company would record it. The blacklisting period was, of course, still on. That Carnegie concert was supposed to be a one-shot deal, 
But we found a lot of friends who were tired of the blacklist, too, and they began filling up concerts in some of the biggest halls in Toronto, Chicago, San Francisco, all over the place. I remember one uh, concert that Weavers gave in Los Angeles, at the, again at the height of the blacklist, in which some very famous movie director uh, sort of snuck backstage afterwards and, and uh, you know, with Preppy with his collar up, but he wanted to show himself and he wanted to to, to make that statement that he, he came to a Weaver's concert and this was his way of, of, of saying something. Uh, his way of, of saying, hmm, McCarthy. Uh, well, he couldn't say quite bring himself to say it out loud and, and so on. Uh, and so I think in that respect, uh, the Weaver's also offered a lot to people because it gave them a channel. Uh, an opportunity to uh, express their feelings and uh, not just listen to what we have to say. There was a result of that concert and, uh, and as a result of the record, really a, a almost a new revival of folk music began that was the uh, inspiration for so many groups that followed almost immediately, the Limelighters, the Kingston Trio, and later on, of course, Peter, Paul, and Mary many of whom were actually at that concert in 1955. A long time ago, Pete and I wrote the Hammer Song. It was printed on the first page of the first issue of Sing Out magazine. The Weavers made a recording of it, which no one bought. Since then, there have been 116 different recordings of it all over the world. If I had a song, I'd sing it in the morning. Sing it in the evening, all over this land. I will sing all the days, yeah. I'll sing all the morning, yeah. I'd sing out the queen, my brothers and my sisters, oh. were our mentors. We learned from them that folk music was a process that had to be uh, carried on, that it had a responsibility to the community from which it sprang, that the folk tradition was uh, one of, of social commitment as well as just old-fashioned have fun together. It's pleasant to know that so many young people that came to Weaver's concerts grew up to be such good performers and socially concerned to boot. And it tickles me to know that Woody's son, Arlo, is carrying on so many of the old traditions while laying down quite a bunch of his own. He grew up to be a fighter against the people's wrongs. He listened to their grief and joy, turned them into songs. His hands were gentle. Well, I guess the Weavers were the first group of people that I ever went to see. So when I started my own little group, it was a reasonable facsimile of what I had seen going on in Carnegie Hall. I'll never forget the first time I played Carnegie 
And all I could remember was the fact that I had sat in the audience and watched the Weavers at Carnegie. And to this day, it's still the only place that scares me. The other thing I remember from that concert was this woman who was standing up on stage who threw her head back in a way that I had never ever seen before and sang at the top of her lungs and soared above these other three men's voices. I mean, they had instruments and voices, and then there was this voice that just, poof, right over the top. And I just, hmm, you know, and I just, I'll never forget that. Now, I went back, went home, and I would stand in front of the mirror, and I'd go, <laughs> sing at the top of my lungs along to these songs. Do it, do know? it. <laughs> and I know that now when I stand on stage, I have a certain stance that I know some of it is mine, but some of it was certainly because there was this woman named Ronnie Gilbert who gave a whole lot of women singers permission to throw their head back and sing at the top of their lungs. Well, I'll tell you without a doubt, nobody knows you when you're down and out. Mm -hmm. oh. Just having any, but when you get back on your feet again, well, everybody wants to be your long lost friend. I'm telling you, without a doubt, nobody knows you when you're down and out. Oh, when you're down and out. I must say I went with a malice of forethought to bring to the concert some of the songs that had been very important to me in the last few years of my life at the time um, that pointed to the things that were affecting people at the moment and most specifically women um, as I had my eyes opened in the last 10 years to uh, my own place in the world as a woman not just a singer not a member of the weavers but as a woman in the world and uh, the person whose songs opened me up to that was Honky Mir. And I wanted very much to sing something of that on the program. Cecilia Castro Salvadores, Ida Amelia Harma. In Chile, in Chile, and the junta, junta, and the junta knows, and the junta knows where she is, and the junta knows where she is hiding and dying. Hay una mujer desaparecida. Hay una mujer desaparecida en Chile, en Chile, en Chile. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever done that. <laughs> Are you doing any new songs or familiar repertory or what? Quite a number of new songs. Fortunately, the other weavers have to sing them. Uh, all I have to do is sing bass, and you can always uh, fake it. That's one of the great advantages of singing bass. You don't have to learn too many new words. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all during this year after the reunion, I was sitting here, as I have for a number of years, trying to maintain a dignified silence and... All of a sudden, they got reporters coming up here, doing interviews, getting into the newspapers and the magazines. We inserted our first ad, the New York Times, on Sunday, October the 12th. When I called the following Tuesday, I was advised that both concerts were completely sold out, which is, of course, a rare event. And then things began to mount. The demand for tickets, we could have gone on at least three to four more nights. Uh, people were 
calling up for tickets from all over the country. As there was more press attention, I had calls from Chicago and Boston, Washington, D.C., Los Angeles and San Francisco, wanting to know if they can have a Weavers reunion in those cities. But of course, this was impossible. The Weavers were not going to go and get together again. And we left the concert or the reunion just for the city of New York. Well, one proposal is to start with Darling Corey. I never could tell from day to day whether I was really up for going to Carnegie, but with the help of people like Pete's wife, Toshi, it got considerably easier. What's this over here? The notes. She helped us get through a lot of problems, and she's given us a lot of support in getting ready for the staging, which I'm very uncertain about. Now, how do I get there and back out? Peter could wheel you out with the lights on. Will the lights be on, is the question. Well, if the lights are off, I can just see myself going flying right out into the audience. Wheels and all. <laughs> well, you probably land in somebody's <laughs> lap. Huh? <laughs> you probably land in somebody's lap that would really enjoy it. Yeah, but who's lap? <laughs> I got my choice of laps well, on this. Give me... Give me, give me your name and address, and I'll make sure they're out front row center. <laughs> Toshi, if it was your lap, I'd fly off any day. Can't have the hanging till I get there. We haven't quite figured out how I'm going to get to Carnegie. I think maybe I'll borrow a car from a local funeral home. I think that's the only way to travel. looking forward to is staying in the biggest hotel in New York and waking up in the morning and ordering the biggest room service breakfast I can find on the menu. Is this the microphone you have to be right on, right in front of? We'd like you to or be on the all of microphone them? on all of them would be ideal. Okay. Okay. Mika, uh, D. If anything, if, if anything, these aren't slightly more sensitive than these. So no, you so can be less close to those. a little more leeway. Yeah. Well, she doesn't have to wear it because she's pretty tall. Boy, so... Much better for me. I didn't just hear you. Got to thinking over what I had missed. Got me a girl and I kissed her and then, oh Lord, I kissed her again. Oh, kisses sweeter than wine. Oh, kisses sweeter than wine. He asked me to marry and we would be so happy all of our life. He said that he pleaded like a natural man, and then, oh Lord, I gave him my hand. Oh, kisses sweeter than wine. Oh, kisses sweeter than wine. folk music and I love the Weavers and so I'm here. And you sort of grew up with them. We're looking around for familiar faces from that era of our life, you know? I was brought up on the Weavers. I love them. <laughs> I haven't seen them in years together and I'm really excited that they're here now. You ever heard the Weavers before? Tonight. Some enchanted evening, 
Oh, when you met a stranger. Oh, no, we can sing the folk song. <laughs> or give me a home where the buffalo roam. Where do you come from? California. Ah, that's a long way. Yeah, all the way from Wisconsin to see this concert and to roller skate. When we saw that they were giving a concert here, I called from where we live and they were, all the good seats were already sold out before it was even listed. I came back again tonight hoping I'm holding this, I'm holding my money up. <laughs> Maybe I'll be lucky and I'll get a ticket. Good luck. Thank you. But you, okay, you should have seen you. the mob here last night. You should have been here. Welcome to the Weaver's Reunion. We don't know which one it is. We can't decide whether it was 31, 2, or 3 years ago. Your program note says 90th anniversary. That ain't us. <laughs> we think 1980 is a very good year for reunions, the year when uh, this nation reached such a gorgeous pinnacle of something or other, whatever it reached, use your own language. If Pete hadn't called us together, I was fixing to retire to the old folks' home in Washington, but it was just taken. <laughs> we have a thought for the year. We've been around long enough to tell you, be of good cheer. This, too, will pass. I've had uh, kidney stones, and I know. <laughs> we can tell you, as a matter of fact, it has often been said by me that <laughs> the future ain't what it used to be, <laughs> and what's more, it never was. How do I know my youth is all spent? 
might get up and go, has got up and went. But in spite of it all, I'm able to grin and think of the places my get up has been. Old age is golden, so I've heard it said. But sometimes I wonder as I crawl into bed with my teeth in the cup and my wig in a draw. And I hope my glass eye doesn't roll on the floor. As sleep dims my vision, I say to myself, is there anything more I should put on the shelf? First Carter, now Reagan, I surely am vexed. But I'll still stick around to see what happens next. How do I know my youth is all spent? My get up and go has got up and went. But in spite of it all, I'm able to grin and think of the places my get up has been. When I was young, my slippers were red. I could kick up my heels right over my head. Then I grew older, my slippers were blue, but still I could dance the whole night through. Now I am old and my slippers are black. I huff to the store and I puff my way back. But never you laugh, I don't mind at all. I'd rather be huffing than not puff at all. How do I know my youth is all spent? My get up and go has got up and went. But in spite of it all, I'm able to grin and think of the places my get up has been. I get up each morning and dust off my wits, open the paper and read the old bits. And if I'm not there, I know I'm not dead. So I eat a good breakfast and roll back to bed. How do I know my youth is all spent? My get up and go has got up and went. But in spite of it all, I'm able to grin and think of the places my get up Oh, sing it again. How do I know my youth is all spent? My get up I think it was a, a question of us getting together at Carnegie and doing nothing but singing the old songs. Um, I'm not even sure whether the whole thing would have been worth it. That was better. Huh? Better. Yeah. We all certainly felt that it was, it was important that that not be uh, a night of, of simply the, the night the old nostalgia burnt down. Uh, it it uh, demanded uh, a vitality. It demanded new concerns. It demanded working up new songs. Uh, just show that we're alive and kicking. Because essentially, I think that that's what that, that evening was about. Um, we're survivors. <laughs> I only mean us, but human race. And... Uh, Survive it doesn't mean just uh, lying there flat on your back. It means being up and around and concerned and, and writing new songs and learning new songs and singing new songs. Hay una mujer desaparecida. A woman has disappeared in Chile. A lament by Holly Near. Desaparecida Hay una mujer Desaparecida En Chile En Chile En Chile En la junta En la junta knows En la junta knows where she is and the junta knows where she is, hiding and dying. Hay una mujer desaparecida. Hay una mujer desaparecida. En Chile, en Chile, en Chile. Clara. Elisa del Carmen Escobar. 
Natalia Elena Morales Rosa Elena Morales Ay, una mujer desaparecida Ay, una mujer desaparecida en Chile, en Chile, en Chile, en la junta, en la junta nos, en la junta nos where she is, en la junta nos where she is, hiding and dying, hay una mujer desaparecida. Hay una mujer desaparecida en Chile, en Chile, en Chile. This is the longest picnic I ever went to. I'm the only one ever to end at Carnegie Hall. In a way, my 33 years with the Weavers have been a picnic. We've had ants and poison ivy, sudden squalls to send us running for cover, and always the promise of sunshine coming back. I'd say we're lucky to have lived through the worst of times and the best of times, times to try the soul, times to free the soul. We've had the hope of surviving to get us through. The love that we shared with our audience at Carnegie Hall was absolutely overwhelming. A once in a lifetime experience and truly worth all the trouble we had getting there. I know this concert will be our last, but we do know that the music is going to go on because it always has. Well, I the seas run dry but if Irene turns her back on me I'm gonna take morphine and die <laughs>
Thank you. 